can be either an affirming or destructive force in the life of vulnerable humans. How can affirming force prevail in human interaction? James informed believers that only those through the discipling requirement in taming the tongue can the fruits of godly wisdom be made visible in the lives of others. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for blessing us to come in today. Lord, we thank you for blessing us to be able to wake up this morning. Lord, we thank you for blessing us to use our tongue to say thank you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for guiding us, giving us wisdom. We have been dealing it on wisdom through this whole month. And God, we thank you for giving us wisdom and giving us knowledge so we can 
do the things you want done yes. in the church. Father, bless me as I give the word today so I can teach and guide everybody and so they can use it and to improve the church. In Jesus' name, amen. We got a good lesson today. We're going to learn about taming the tongues. I'm going to talk about the wisdom for teachers, the wisdom from the environment, the wisdom for the tongue, and a wisdom for double minded. That last one is going to be the most important because this is what we are dealing with as we are in this time, the double minded person. First, let's go through the scripture so we can get this in and then we can get started. I'm going to reread now the New Living Testament. I'm going to start with James, the third chapter, 1 to 12. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you shall become teachers in the church. Let me say that again. Not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged most strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go whatever it wants. Let me say it again. We can make a large horse, a large horse go whatever we want by the means of a small bit in its mouth. We can make a large horse go, large horse go whatever we want by the means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder make a huge ship turn whatever the pilot chooses to go, even through the winds or storm. Are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speech, but a tiny spark can set a great force on fire. And among all parts of the body, the tongue is the flame of the fire. Its whole word of wickedness, corruption, your entire body. It can set the whole life of fire, for it sets on fire by hell itself. Among all the body parts, the tongue is the flame of fire as the whole word of wickedness, corruption, the entire body can set the whole life on fire for it is set by fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals and birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes the praise of the Lord and the Father sometimes curse those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubbles out with fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig on the cheese produce olive or a grapevine produce figs? No, you can draw fresh water from salty spring. I came to you from James 3, 1 to 12. In the King James Version, in the first verse, he said, My brethren, be not many masters. Masters is the same thing as teachers. First thing he letting everybody know is when you become a teacher, you hold to a higher standard. That's, that's mean as a minister, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, a night teacher, a missionary. Your job in the church is to teach and guide. Let me give you some background. We already know the background of James. We know James was Jesus' half-brother. We know that for a fact. And also, he was the first bishop of the church. I'm going to go a little bit in the background. Internal strikes was also taking place within the church. Christian was dealing with the doctrine, ardent by false teacher, power struggle, gossip, and slander. The Christian was being encouraged to pursue self-fulfillment. During this time, many philosophers believed and taught 
the importance of knowledge for the sake of knowledge. They was going through the same thing we are going through today. We dealing with false preachers, false doctrine, saying this is Christian, it is not Christian, it's religion. Many things you have to read and study. Like we said, we talked about last week. We know what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian means you must have the faith and believe that Jesus died on the cross. First, you have to believe he's the son of God. He died on the cross. He died. He rose from the dead and he ascended. That's what it means to be Christian. Anything else other than that ain't got nothing to do with what it means to be a Christian. That's all what it means to be a Christian. When people say, I'm not a Christian, I'm religious. No, to be a Christian means you must believe that Christ is your Lord and Savior. And God said, if you believe in my son, anything you ask in his name, I will give it to you. That's what we, this is what we're dealing with. People is taking religion and adding in to say this is what it is to be a Christian. No, they're just rules of the church or rules they want to have. The Baptists may have a couple of things they want to say. The Pentecostals may have apostolic, church of God in Christ. As long as you believe that Jesus died on the cross, you believe he's the son of God, you are a Christian. Now I'm going to go into about the wisdom of teaching, which is very important. Because God said we all are teachers, but when you appointed a job in the church, you are held to a higher standard than anybody else. It's already said it's written in the word. When God said it's written, he's going to do it. He's going to hold you more accountable than anybody. Not everybody is called to be a pastor. You might be called to be a minister. You might be called to be a teacher, but you're not called to be a pastor. To be a pastor, you got to learn how to deal with different spirits. And some people is not ready to be pastors. Some people have never been called to be pastors. Only thing their job was to be a minister to bring the word. <coughs> the word of wisdom is aimed at those who would teach the word of the Lord. Teachers are in position to inform and misinform others. Jane Carson that this highly valued and respected position, so it should not be taken lightly. James warned those who aspire to teach and inform them they will see a harsher judgment and greater con condemning. You're going to be higher, higher than anybody because you're supposed to teach in God. You're supposed to set an example. Don't sit there and act like you want to be a Sunday school teacher and then the next day you sit up in the club drinking doing everything deliberately when you doing it on purpose now it's different when you're going to you're going to be a, when you come to christ you're going to be a new creature all things pass away all things pass away all things become new when you become new there are going to be things you're going to be working on there's things you're going to be dealing with and you're going to be making that change, but you're making that change for good. But if you do wrong, you can say, God, forgive me. And you keep moving on and your slate is clean. You as clean as white as snow. God ain't going to look at what you did before and that. As long as you're going to that goal. Jane also warned teachers to examine their motive not to be self-serving. Teachers are tasked with a stronger speak ethic as a way of achieving maturity needed to keep the whole body in check. Your job as a teacher, as a leader in the church, leader in your home, even as your home, you are the leader, you are the teacher. You are guiding your kids how to survive in the world, how to deal with people, how to talk with people, how to respond to people. Teach them is important to gain knowledge and wisdom so they can make it. Because when you dead and gone, you know they can survive and they can make it. But some parents out here not teaching these kids how to make it. They're teaching them how to survive the wrong way. And their life is being cut short. Now I'm gonna talk about the wisdom from the environment. James demonstrated the challenge of taming the tongue using an image of, of things that affect daily life of survival. During that time, horse was their mean of transportation. Our transportation today, some people still use horses, but it's not on the top of the level. Some people use cars, boats, trains, planes. This is our transportation. Horses are common for the land transportation, but a wild horse have to be tamed in order to be used. 
A wild horse have to be tamed. What is saying a wild horse have to be trained to do what you need it to do. You can't take something that never been trained and been taught and make expect them to do what you want to do. As young as we the church is coming to after this COVID, we gonna have people come near, we gonna have kids that never been in church. We gonna have parents of them kids. You remember we are dealing with the, the crackhead grandparents was crackheads, so we dealing with their grandkids. We are dealing the after effects of crack. So these kids and people and people have not never been in church, have never been taught. We cannot just throw them to the side. We got to train them. We got to show them. That's why we had to become teachers. Because we are held to the highest standard because we've been through the fire. We've been through the storm. We got to show them how. Amen. A skillful rider can control a horse every move. A spirit's captain will successfully guide a ship or any side by a rotor. Particularly in the, if a ship experiences severe sea condition, a master rotor will make a difference between death and and deliverance. James challenged believers to control their speech and voice self-destruction. Describing the tongue as fire. James cautioned against allow Satan to use the tongue to set it on fire a course of nature. The tongue has power to ignite fire of hell. Your mouth will get you in trouble. Your tongue I'm going to get to that part before I jump into it. A horse one little piece of wood or leather can't control the horse. When a horse bites down, when a horse runs and gather, it bites. A horse only have a front set of teeth. They don't have a back teeth. And when a horse bites down, when they go fast, you make the horse go fast, it bites down harder on their bit. You have to let the bit your reins, you loosen up so that bit can loosen up. Then you snatch the bit back and let the bit hit the back of the gums of that horse to control it, to make him stop because it's too sensitive. You know how it feels when something gets on your gums. You be digging, you'll grab paper, you'll grab a toothpick, you'll break a straw off a broom and try to get that piece of meat out of your mouth and you'll be happy. What James was saying, a small thing can control a lot of things. Ask me being in the ship or when a, a ship, a quartermaster drive, what drives that ship? You got a quartermaster to know what he's doing and he can maneuver that ship in a storm. A rotor can make a ship go left and right in that storm. That storm may be going to the left. He can make that ship still go straight because he can control the rudder. That's what God, that's what James was telling the church. You got to learn how to control your tongue. You don't snap out. That's why God said the meek shall inherit her. You got to learn how to be meek. Not the meek to say you bow down. You have to learn how to control your mouth. Control your anger, your emotion. Don't be quick to jump off. <clears throat> In them days, it was the tongue. Our days is the cell phone, computer. The thumb is the tongue. So don't only let people be slick like, I can say what I want to say. I'm using my, my thumb. I'm not using my tongue. No. Yo, any way you communicate is the same thing. You so quick to go off of somebody don't have the facts, don't have the information you need, you're not using wisdom, you're not using your smart, and you let somebody take you out of who you're supposed to be. And you're letting the devil come in. So they let the furling know you ain't ready all the way what you need to be. Amen. Nobody must make you change your composure or who you are. That further lets you know you fake it. That lets you know you're not real who you are, you just a front. Because you cannot let nobody take you out of who you are. You let somebody say one little word. Say one little thing, you really snap to go off. That's in you. Your tongue cannot be tamed because your tongue is instrument as whatever's in you, it's going to come out. Either going to be good or bad. You have to learn how to contain your tongue. It's in you, it's going to come out. That's what the tongue is made for, to speak whatever in you, good or bad. It's going to tell you, your tongue going to tell you, and your action will show what come out of your tongue. 
Animal can be tamed, but a tongue cannot. Once again, an animal can be tamed, but your tongue cannot. However, James said, the skill does not exist that can tame a tongue. You can't never contain your tongue. I don't care how much you try. What you can control is your mind. What you can control is your spirit. If your mind is controlled and you got good in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, you have God in you, you have peace, you have humble, ain't no way nobody can make you go off. Now your tongue, you can get upset, you can get mad, but it's the way you can do it and your tongue can still be good. James similarly caralized the untamed tongue. James described, description recalled David prayer to be delivered from evil of men having sharp tongues like a serpent. A snake will bite you. A snake will play with you. A snake will look at you. A snake will lay right next to you. It's like the story, this man had his snake. He was playing with this snake. He lived with the snake. He run with the snake. He rubbed with the snake. A snake ain't gonna change what they are. If they gonna get you, they gonna get you. A snake gonna bite you, it gonna bite you. A snake ain't gonna never change. Snake just sit there and wait. It's like a man going after a woman. If a man ain't got no good intention, he'll sit there and wait 10, 15 years to get that woman, to get her the way he wanna get her, to get revenge. That's how been proven in the Bible had told you. If a man can work 12 years for a woman and she turn out to be the woman, he wait turn on a man would get you. A man would sit there to be close in your circle, be three degrees from you for somebody you know, so he can he, he know life gonna change, something gonna change, and he gonna wait till the opportunity to come in. James issued this sober, sober reality, words kills without God. James warned believers will not only destroy other Christians, but consumed by the daily poison resident within the power of the tongue. Where evil's in you, gonna come out. Where that tongue will bite you. Where hurt, they say sticks and stones will hurt my bone, word will never hurt. That's just a bold-faced lie. That word will cut you like a two-edged sword. That word will hurt you. You can put cursing on somebody without using a curse word. Cursing, cursing somebody as you is no good. You ain't gonna make it. You ain't doing nothing right. You never encourage nobody. You beat them down and they start thinking, they start believing. That's why your words will hurt people. Your words encourage people. You believe in them. You give them the thing. You tell them they fall down, you right there with them. Your words encourage them. It builds them up. This was God. James was, God was telling James to give to the church. Watch your tongue. Tame your tongue. How do you tame your tongue? Ask God, give me knowledge and wisdom. You want to know how else to tame your tongue? The Beatitudes. Study and read the Beatitudes. Understand what it means to be meek. They did not, meek does not mean to be weak. Learn how to be meek and kind. Sometimes you need to be meek just to sit back and take a couple of steps to think about before you say something. Don't sit there and be so quick to snap and go off. Wait and tell me success the situation. Then speak on it. Because when you don't do that, you're going to say something and you're going to regret it. You can't take it back. Then you got to apologize. Now I'm going to go into the main thing for wisdom with these tongues when you deal with double-minded. Double-minded me too. Yin, yang, good, bad, whatever. Double-minded person is the most dangerous person. A double-minded person will cause more confusion in your home and that's why the husband and wife had to be as one. If the wife, if you know your wife told them kids not to do something, you know she gonna go off. You don't go behind her and say, that's okay. You causing confusion. You got to be as one. 
James addressed the double-minded. Double-minded talking contradict by using an example of believers who speak both sides of their mouth, blessing God yet cursing people. That's what I was talking about. God is good. God is wonderful. Oh, you ain't nothing. You always messing up. You always doing this. You you double talking. God is constant, consistent, and Christian speak must consistently re reflect the heart of God. The word of from the mouth speak the content of your heart. James said, "Blessing can neither come from the heart filled with venom nor cursed from the heart from love." In much the same way from an olive cannot come from a fig tree, nor can a spring produce both fresh and salt water. James punctuated the need for believers to think and say and do those things that reflect who they are in Christ. We can choose to listen to the voice of God and do his will, or we can choose to put ourselves first and care and concern a love for others last. You cannot, you have to be one way. You have to believe in what you are saying. You have to believe and do everything as one. You cannot spend hate. You cannot be a leader in the church. Say you love God and be an officer of the church, officer of the table, and you speak against your pastor. Once you speak against your pastor, you is destroying what this church is supposed to be built upon and built upon. You cannot go against the pastor. You're supposed to help the pastor. When these churches get to start talking against the pastor, they're double-minded, then the next thing you know, the church starts to fall. It breaks apart. People don't want to show up. They only want to show up on their day. You show up every day. You support everybody. You want to support your day, you support them on their day. Yeah. Amen. This is what this double-minded have turned this church. And now God has stopped the church, shut the church down. Now you can't come in. Now you don't know how to act. Oh, I miss the church. You are the church. This is this a building we come in. Once we come in the building, we fill the church with the Holy Ghost. We fill the church with the Spirit of God. We are the church. But if we double-minded, we are not the church. We are something else that's for the devil footstool to use to disrupt God's mission. God's mission, once I said, is always have been. We're supposed to bring people to Christ to show them Christ. We're supposed to be the light of the world and the church, supposed to, the world supposed to look at us and see how to survive and live. Not to believe in Donald Trump. We're supposed to believe in the word of God. And when we have double-minded folk, double-minded folks will mess everything up and tear it up. Double-minded will mess your home up. <clears throat> Husband, do not post to go against the wife. Wife, do not post to get in the whatever. Like I was saying earlier, if the wife tells the kids to do one thing, you stick to her rules. No, I can't do that. Your mama, I, I, I'm going to talk to your mama, but I can't go against her. Kids, we try to slick like people in church. Well, pastor say this, I can do that. Pastor say he can do this. Pastor say he needs you to do that, 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 that. Pastor, you, you called the pastor. And pastor, did you say, in the first thing, pastor said, I did not call and tell them. Why pastor going to take somebody lower than you to do something? He'll tell somebody higher to tell you to do something. Or if you at his level, he would tell you what to do. You cannot go against him. This is when you got to be humble and meek. You got to sit back like, wait a minute, look at the situation. Why would God, why would pastor tell this person to do something, to tell me? If you the administrator, why would God, why would the pastor or God would tell somebody like that? To tell you to do something. He would tell you. And that's what double-minded. God has stopped this church. This one reason why we're not really having church. It was too many double-minded people destroying the church. They were tearing, breaking pastors down. They were tearing, destroying church. 
You can't have no double-minded person leading the organization and we got people coming in. They like you just like in the world. What's, what's the point of me coming in? That's why James said we have to have wisdom. Ask God for wisdom and knowledge and learn how to control our tongue. Learn your beatitude. Give it to your God to make you meek. Meek does not mean to be weak. Meek means make you more calm. Know how to talk with people with love, with passion. Give them hope. Give them something to believe in. A double-minded person ain't going to give you nothing. On their government, give you say something you want to hear. That's your president. He's double-minded. I'm going to tell you what you want to hear, but I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to say this to make it sound good. I'm going to do this over here. That's why you cannot deal with a double-minded church. And the church cannot have a double-minded person leading. And the church cannot have a double-minded person to do the different jobs in the church because it would cause confusion. Let me read this before we get ready to close. What a wonderful gift speech is. Christians have ability to exalt, coach, and build up other believers through our speech. Seemingly, our words provide the vehicle to lovingly counsel the lost, soothe, and counsel the suffering and bereaved. The gift of speech is most perfect employed when we speak the word of truth, witness to others, God's saving plan. We must be very careful not to abuse this wonderful gift. Many Christians would never imagine causing someone physical harm. Yet, it's exactly what we do when we say thoughtless, careless, unkind things to others. And this is fact. Once we open our mouth and say careless things, especially to women, we gonna have a lot of women come to our church. When the church doors open back up, God said we're going to have more women and men come to our church. We got to watch our tongues what we say. Amen. We got to show them, teach them, guide them. And so when they start getting teaching God, they going to start conforming, doing what they see everybody else do. But once you start bashing them because they don't have the right clothes, okay, they don't have the right clothes. Long as they here, long as they coming, long as they getting the word, they gonna make take time. And when time come and God see you putting that in them, God gonna bless them to get to that point. They gonna have the dresses. They gonna have. They gonna learn this. Churches have changed. You don't have to be in no three-piece suit to be in no church every Sunday, sitting there hot, sweating, about to fall out, trying to look like that's man, that's religion. God didn't say nothing about the way you dress to come to him. He said you bring your heart to him. You bring your soul to him. And he will direct your path. People come up here and doing this, this coming in, think you're supposed to dress a certain. No, you don't have to have, to have no hat on the church. You don't have to. Wherever this pastor has said to say, hey, y'all can come in with tennis shoes, y'all can wear jogging suits, come in, we're going to worship God, we're going to be comfortable. That's what God wants us to be as one. That is man. That is, that's what man has set up the way we post a dress, the way we come in. When the pastor has set whatever he wants his guideline to be, that's what his guideline to be. Some people think take religion and use their tongue to make it like it's Christian. No, it's not Christian. Religious is this rules and regulation or organization a church may have. It don't stop you from going to heaven. If you wore a mini skirt to church all the time, it do not stop you from going to heaven. The reason they don't have women wear mini skirts in church varies because we are human. We are men. Men, some men are attracted to legs. That's it. Amen. But they don't stop you from going to heaven. What they do is stop that uh, Jezebel spirit, that enticement. It's like a woman sit up in the front pew. She got a short dress. She have a cloth or something covering their legs 
where the church rise at. So they want to entice nobody. That's it. But it don't stop you from going to heaven. Unless you're intentionally trying to entice somebody. Then. It's just like drinking do not stop you for going in. But what happened with drinking is when you drink and you continue to drink, you destroy your Bible. It doesn't say nothing about smoking. But the more you smoke, you defy your temple, your body. That smoking will destroy you. See, man had taken things and saying you can't go to heaven. God already put the rules in the book. What, what you need to do to go to heaven. What it means to be a Christian. God already said what it means to be a Christian. That means you believe in my son. He died on the cross. The blood he shed. You are healed. Anything you ask in, in his name, I would do it. That's the covenant. And the covenant of old comes with to the covenant of new. That's why you have to learn how to contain your tongue. Taming the tongue is very, it will destroy the church or build the church. That's why certain people need to be in charge. And when the church is start back, some people going to lose their position. Some people going to get knocked down a peg. Some people like, no, you, you cannot be there. We're going a different direction because your tongue is not helping. If you call to be a minister, you are called to preach, you would need to preach. If you're a minister, sometimes you may not preach every Sunday morning. Sometimes you might speak some Sunday's day. You might be called to go. You say you're a minister, you can be called to church, but when your church needs Sunday school teachers, when your church needs youth teachers, if you're a minister, you're supposed to teach. Amen. You are called to teach. If you was called a teacher and not teaching, you don't need to be in the ministry. And you are a hindrance to the pastor. If the pastor cannot come to the funeral on time, he needs somebody to read a scripture, just read that your job is supposed to support the pastor, read the scripture, you're a minister. Your pastor do not supposed to open up the service, he don't have to, he got ministers, he got missionaries, he got deacons to open up the service to read and pray and get the service started. We don't need double-minded people as the, the James was talking about in the church. We don't need this. See, in the very beginning, they said this was going on in the first church. You remember, the first church was nothing but prostitutes, whores, pimps, and John. The first church was Las Vegas. The first church was nothing. It was by a temple. There was nothing but sexual. The first church was nothing but whores, pimps, prostitutes. That's what the first church was. But James was teaching them, watch your mouth. Watch your tongue. The first church, they were dealing with false teacher, power struggle. Why black people get in any type of organization, it has to be a power struggle. Yes, somebody going to lead. Somebody going to lead has somebody in charge. And we posted this, go along with the person and help the person. Not sit there and try to knock them off. Oh, they think they know what they're doing. Be that double minded. And this was going on then, is going on now. And the main thing, gossip and slander. That would destroy church. It would tear down the church. A power struggle, gossip, slander would be the fastest thing to turn down the church. Did you see sister so-and-so come in church? Sister so-and-so was sitting over there looking at deacon, blah, blah, blah. Gossiping, don't know the truth, don't know what's going on, don't know nothing about the woman or nothing. Because they can't stand how she look. You jealous. Jealousy destroyed the church. Somebody get mad because they get mad because they may like some Women and men is, is bad in this in church. 
They may like this brother in the church. That brother ain't studying them in the man and the moon. His eyes on something else. But you so jealous because you want him so bad. If he, yeah, I can't have him, you can't have him, you will cause mess in the church. We don't need this double-minded in the church. We are going to a new age. We're going to a new time. Things what used to go on in the church is not going on no more. Time has changed, and we got to accept the change, accept what the change, what God wants. We have to accept what God wants in his church, and God wants us to tame our tongues. He wants us to Get ourselves together with our tongue. Because when these people come in off the street, they ain't never been in church. They never heard of the word God. They ain't never heard of a song, Yes, Jesus Love Me. So we got to be ready. We got to watch our tongues. We got to learn how to be meek and humble. We got to come in and sanctify in the church. God said, when you come into my house, Y'all said this is church is his house. When we come in, we make this holy and sanctify when we walk in. We don't walk in with a double-minded. We right. don't walk in with slander. We don't walk in with gossip. We don't come in with no power struggle. And we do not come in with false teaching. We do not. If you're a minister, you're a minister. To be a minister means you're a helpmate to the pastor. You don't come in trying to steal members to have your own clique and say, I'm finna start my own church and pull the church. If they want to leave, they leave on their own accord. And they come to the pastor and pastor, I think God lead me a different way. And show that man of God respect to leave. This don't leave because the minister leaving. Amen. We in coming into the new age. We come into the new church. Like our slogan say. A church with a, with a renewed mind. Ephesians 4, 20 to 32. The church got to come in with a new mind. When you come in with a renewed mind, you have a renewed tongue. You're going to talk different. You're going to walk different. You're going to look dif different. And we're going to become the leaders what God wants in his church. Amen. This is what the Sunday school lesson talking about taming the tongue. That's what the Sunday school lesson talking about. Once we, the church, learn how to tame its tongue, learn not to beat people down, not to have a jealous spirit, the church will flourish, it will grow. And it would dominate and it would do the works what God wants. God wants us to help the sick, help the poor, help the people. When we sit down tearing each other, tearing them down, you can't help and do God's will. That's what they mean. And as the song is saying, leave me, I am weak. God, and I need you got to have faith, strength and you have to believe. And when by God in yourself and the wisdom we need to make it. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the Sunday school lesson you came with us today. Father, show them how to tame their tongue. Lord, give them the wisdom and knowledge. Lord, show them how to be meek enough to understand. Lord, bless them to slow their mind down for they react. Lord, show them how to use their tongue to help, to heal, to save. Father, bless the ones who are sick, they cannot be a Sunday school. Lord, bless the ones who can be a Sunday school. Lord, bless the Wilson family as they deal with this situation with their family. Lord, bless the Buckley family. Lord, bless my mother as she's going through this. Lord, bless the pastor. Get him the strength during this time. It's rough on him. He's weary. He's tired. He need help. But God give him the strength he need. Lord give the deacon the strength they need. Lord bless the missionary. Lord bless the mother of the church. Lord bless them all. Lord bless them give them the wisdom and knowledge they need. Lord bless the tongues they gonna use to build our church. 
back where it needs to be, make it stronger. All these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.